Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Sarah Leonard. I'm an editor at Descent Magazine. Um, I will introduce Descent Magazine itself very briefly and then the panelists and turn it over to Mark. Um, Descent is currently celebrating its 60th anniversary. It's a political quarterly um, and for Descent, political coverage has always been international. Um, it's something we've been committed to from the beginning. Um, and most recently, um, under the guidance of Jeff Wasserstrom, who's on our board, um, our coverage of China in particular has been growing um, with a special issue last year, which I think you can find over there at that table, uh, where you should also do things like sign up for our email list to find out about more things like this and subscribe. Um, additionally, um, our coverage of India is growing um, we just published a piece by Mehboob Jelani, who's on this panel now, um, and that will be continuing to grow. Um, we're really honored to be hosting with the India China Institute. Um, this is our second event with the Institute. Um, it's always a pleasure, and in this case, it's allowing us to bring together um, people to talk about two very different political movements, both operating under the banner of anti-corruption, and use that comparison to try to shed some light on the broader political challenges posed in both countries. Um, so I'm just going to introduce the panelists, and we'll get started. Um, our, our moderator is Mark Fraser, who's professor of politics and co-academic director of the India-China Institute here at the New School. He teaches and writes about the political economy of China with a focus on labor movements and social policy. He has authored op-ed pieces and essays for the New York Times, Daedalus, The Diplomat, and World Politics Review. He's the author of Socialist Insecurity, Pensions and the Politics of Uneven Development in China, and The Making of the Chinese Industrial Workplace. Um, to his left is Jonathan Shannon. He is news editor at The New Yorker. From 2010 to 2013, he was the senior editor of Caravan, India's first narrative journalism magazine. Um, to his left is Jeff Wasserstrom, who is a member of Descent's board and teaches Chinese history at UC Irvine, where he also serves um, in a courtesy appointment in the law school and serves as editor of the Journal of Asian Studies. In addition to contributing to academic journals, he often writes for newspapers, magazines, and blogs, and co-edits the Asia section of the Los Angeles Review of Books. His most recent book is China in the 21st Century, What Everyone Needs to Know, an updated edition of which was published by Oxford last summer. To his left is Jai Yang, uh, who is on the editorial staff of The New Yorker as well. Um, she regularly writes about social, economic, and political issues in China for NewYorker.com. She is also a frequent contributor to the New York Times Book Review, Slate, the LA Review of Books, and the Virginia Quarterly, among other publications. And to her left is Mehboob Jelani, a former staff writer at The Caravan, who's extensively covered anti-corruption and developmental politics of India. He's currently studying for an MA in journalism at Columbia University. Thank you, Sarah. I will um, work from the podium here to give our panelists a little more room and uh, start with a few questions. Um, but before doing so, um, I wanted to just briefly, because I see so many uh, new faces uh, welcoming uh, you all here today, uh, to say a few words briefly about the India-China Institute. We are uh, now 10 years old. Uh, we are a center at the New School, uh, and we sponsor research and public programs like this one uh, that engage uh, and encourage us to engage uh, comparisons between China and India. Uh, there are very few people in the room who are experts on both places, including uh, our panel, as we were just talking. Um, uh, we're going to be learning from each other as we discuss uh, the places that we've written about and worked on. Uh, the India-China Institute also uh, encourages uh, research programs and, and public programs uh, that look at historical and contemporary interactions between uh, India and China, uh, uh, not just the states, but, but the people who live there. Uh, and, and that's another part of our, our intellectual mission, uh, looking at Chinese and Indian interactions around the globe. Uh, today's uh, program is being uh, streamed live from our website and will be available uh, in the future uh, in full on, on our website and on that of Descent and others uh, uh, around who want to, to link to us. Um, the program today, as you know, addresses one of the most, maybe I shouldn't even say one of, 
uh, the most contentious uh, and most passionate uh, debates uh, going on in, in China and India uh, today, in political life anyway, we have uh, a moment uh, right now where there is a major um, anti-corruption uh, campaign going on in China. Uh, we have at the same time a pivotal uh, election uh, in two months' time taking place in India. Uh, and by most accounts, one of the most, uh, um, you know, one of the central issues in, in the minds of the voters, at least according to the polls, uh, is this issue about, uh, you know, who's corrupt and how do we uh, punish through electoral means those, who, uh, those parties who have been engaged in corruption. I should say, when I was in, uh, in Bombay or Mumbai a month ago, uh, uh, I was uh, introducing my, my institute, the India-China Institute, to someone who uh, persuasively argued that, uh, you know, China has us beat in many things in terms of infrastructure and, and you know, whatever you want to talk about, but we, we will always be ahead of, of, of China in corruption. And so uh, I think it's an interesting uh, angle is to actually ask, you know, uh, how you identify corruption in, in your own uh, your own city, your own uh, nation, and compare it with uh, the corruption uh, that goes on out outside it in other places. Um, but the title of today's program, Anti-Corruption Movements in China and India, um, implies, of course, a negation of something. Something is, is anti, there's a movement against something. Um, but what that something is and how we negate it, uh, if we can negate it, um, you often hear people saying we can eliminate something like corruption. And this brings us to the naughty definition, naughty problem of how we define uh, corruption. And here is where I think our panelists can, can help us uh, at the outset and throughout is to provide from their observations of, of having worked and written about uh, of China and India, um, you know, the, the context, the careful context that's needed to uh, understand uh, how people um, interpret uh, corruption, what the meanings they attach to it, what, what actions are considered corrupt and what actions are considered, uh, you know, not corruption. Uh, because so much of what we see and read and hear about in, uh, let's say, more of the standard conventional political economy think tank space is uh, relying on the um, way too frequently cited uh, rankings of corruption done by Transparency International, which, uh, as they honestly say, uh, is, uh, I mean, the way they conceive of corruption is um, uh, acts being undertaken by the public sector. Uh, so in that sense that corruption can only be in, occur when a government official uh, is, is taking money. Uh, of course, this leaves aside lots of other uh, possible uh, money, exchange that, money exchanges that go on when uh, government officials or public sector uh, officials are not, uh, not being involved. And, and by the way, Transparency International, in terms of their rankings, um, has India and China about in the middle of the pack. Out of 177 countries, I think uh, China is, is 80th and, and India is 94th, meaning uh, India is indeed, by that ranking, a little bit more corrupt than China. Uh, but uh, let me now turn it over to the panelists uh, with, with a question, a more specific pointed question, which is if we, uh, I think it's fairly clear uh, that corruption is not something that's exactly new <laughs> in, in, in anywhere, uh, but especially it's not new uh, in China and India. Maybe there have been new forms of corruption since economic reforms have, uh, you know, been undertaken in the last uh, three, two or three decades. But um, what explains this sudden surge in interest in, uh, in corruption in, in, in both places? Uh, why is it uh, being talked about so much, at least in the media? And is it also being talked about in the same way by the, the you know, ordinary folks that, that you interview and, and meet with and, and talk to uh, when you're there? Well, I think <clears throat> there's a lot of different ways to answer that question. I think, though, when you talk about economic reforms, that points me at least to one good starting point, which is that the sums of money involved are getting to be bigger and bigger. So, um, you know, your Indians with a bit of sort of trademark black humor like to point backward to the sort of earliest cases of corruption. Um, it was a scam, I think, in 1950 or 1951 uh, over the purchase of Jeeps. 
uh, that's often seen as the first corruption scandal, and you know people can run through this whole long list. Um, I think what has happened in the last five or six years is a sort of twofold process coming from these economic reforms. So you have economic reforms that have taken place, and I think whether you're a liberal or you're more of a sort of you know laissez-faire market person, you would agree that the economic reforms have been in part incomplete. So there's been a certain degree of reform, particularly as it involves you know foreign direct investment, but the government still is very heavily involved in a lot of decisions pertinent to the doing of business. And because of the incompletion or the incomplete nature of those reforms, you have opportunities to make enormous amounts of money uh, that come from being in a preferential position with regard to the government when it comes to contracts, concessions, allocation of mines, uh, telecommunications spectrum, things like this. And as these deals have gotten to be bigger and bigger, the sums of money that are involved in this corruption have become astronomical. I mean, to a point where, uh, you know, people will only remember, you know, the, the everyone, every Indian remembers the figure, which is 1.76 lakh crore, uh, which a lakh is 100,000 and a crore is 10 million. So I believe this is 1.76 trillion rupees which was said to be the amount of money that the government lost in the 2G scam, which had to do with the failure to auction off telecommunications spectrum. And you know, when I was a caravan, uh, I edited a piece by the editor of the magazine who had gone down to the state whose party was in charge of this scam. And he would, this guy went out and did interviewing, talking to people who were like taxi drivers, and all of them know this number. You know, the number is so big that no one can forget it. So I think that you have these figures getting to be bigger and bigger, and so Indians will, again, with this black humor, say, you know, back in the day, you could bribe someone with a couple of suitcases full of cash, but now it's gotten to be so huge. I think at the same time, what has come from the generation of economic reforms is this expectation that India should be a superpower, that, you know, we're about to take our rightful place at the high table of first world nations, and these corruption scandals are humiliating. And there is a sense that, you know, there's a lot of nationalist upsurge that has been kind of deflated by a lot of this corruption. So there's a kind of perfect storm of, on the one hand, these crooks in politics are robbing us and they're getting phenomenally rich, but they're also depriving us of our rightful place among the most powerful nations in the world. Jeff, some of that sounds familiar. Yeah, some of it sounds very familiar. Um, an added twist with China, thinking historically, is that the stories, I like to think about the stories that the Communist Party told in the 1950s about why it deserved to rule uh, instead of the Nationalist Party of Chiang Kai-shek that they displaced. And there are a set of stories they told. They said, until we took power, China was being pushed around by foreign countries. Our sovereignty wasn't solid. Um, they said, before we took power, um, China was not very equal. The very rich and the very poor lived totally different kinds of lives. And before we took power, there were corrupt officials. And there was a small, co there were fa people with tight family ties to the people in power who got to benefit in ways that nobody else could benefit from a thoroughly corrupt uh, system. And if you think about those stories, um, the story about China being a place where people rich and poor, there's not much difference for them, just doesn't hold up at all. Nobody thinks it holds up. The story of China being more able to, to, to fend for itself in the world is something that the Communist Party can still point to and say that China is resurgent and in a powerful position in the world. And you see the government, since Xi Jinping took power, building on something that went on before with very strong nationalist rhetoric in, in things like the island's disputes with Japan. And then there's this corruption thing where the story has frayed. Um, there isn't this idea that the Communist Party is somehow not a corrupt entity. Lots of people think of the Communist Party as corrupt. So the anti-corruption drive is a way to manage that story. And the way to manage that story is to say the central government is determined to weed out problems at the local level. And once again, there are growing amounts involved in, in the corruption. And so the government is saying, and we won't just go after small-time corrupt people, we're going after really big-time corrupt people. 
And so there have been very high profile takedowns of people accused of, of profiting in very big ways. But there's an effort to deflect the anger at those large sums of corruption from the very central, uh, the very central authorities. So the tendency is to go after either local officials or people who are tied to a faction that's clearly separate from Xi Jinping and company. So there's been a takedown of bigger and bigger um, corrupt figures, but they're all, uh, in the recent past, people who were tied to Bo Xilai, who was seen as a competitor with Xi Jinping for power. China doesn't mess with these messy things of elections, so it wasn't actually that he was running against Xi Jinping for president, but people were thinking of him as a possible alternative um, focus of, of, of attention. So once he came down, then there's going after people connected with him. And Bo Xilai himself was very much a part of the central authorities, and the central authorities were approving toward the end of things he was doing in Chongqing before he fell. But after he fell, he was kind of recast as a local figure run amok. And the idea is that the center, once it finds out things, deals appropriately, but there are always going to be bad apples at the local level that need to be moved against. So I see this anti-corruption drive as something the center is doing to try to preserve the fiction of it not being the problem with this kind of corruption. Because if it's seen as being part of the problem of corruption, and if that corruption is largely lots of money going to the hands of family members of the top officials, then it starts to look a lot like exactly the Chiang Kai-shek uh, regime that the Communist Party is predicated, its legitimating myth is that it changed things radically from, from how things were then. And this helps explain in part why there's been such uh, fervor at trying to push back against reports in the Western press detailing astronomical sums made by members of the families of the very top uh, central authorities. Um, yes, I mean, I think <laughs> that's, I think, I mean, going back to stories, I think um, the, you know, the Chinese Communist Party has built itself on um, largely a myth of um, being the righteous one and the party that um, you know does not spend lavishly, unlike the Kuomintang, and uh, um, and you know I think it came to power because of its of its success in uh, in in you know of its propaganda, and you know the last ten years I've seen um, the growth of social media, which I think you know has. Um, challenged the the Communist Party in you know more troubling ways than it's ever faced before um, you know Weibo the, the, the uh, Chinese equivalent of Twitter has really given a voice to um, to people who couldn't really co who couldn't connect the dots for themselves and see you know the corruption at you know all levels of the government. So um, at this point, I think the Chinese, the central government wants to focus on corruption more so than ever to deflect attention um, <coughs> away from, um, you know, the exposures that have, co that, you know, online of the misconduct and malfeasance by, by um, Chinese officials that, that, you know, that's revealed online. And I think, you know, despite um, the, you know the huge apparatus of censors. It's um, it's still very very difficult to control. Um, you know the enormous access that uh, you know more than half of the Chinese population have to to the online community. And I think corruption needs to be a bigger enemy um, at this point more so than ever um, to uh, to combat the you know rising discontent by you know by the people and what they're discovering and what they're able to communicate um, to each other about what they're discovering. I think and there are two, two forms of corruption which exist in India. One is where a politician violates a law or a, or a, or a government servant uh, violates a law and indulges in corruption. And the other one is wherein a big politician or industrialist works out a system. He knows the, the flaws uh, a particular law has, and then he pinpoints those flaws and then tries to devise his own strategy accordingly and you know makes millions of dollars. Uh, when it comes to poor people or people like lower middle class, uh, they deal with the system wherein a law is violated. And uh, until recently, there wasn't any sort of like advocacy in terms of like 
somebody violating a law and someone talking about it openly. So it's not that the government never uh, responded to this problem. There were a few initiatives taken in the last 15 years, particularly. Um, there is this Right to Information Act, which is uh, like FOIA, the way it's in the US. And um, you can hold any government official accountable if he, you suspect there is some you know, uh, crony capitalism or corruption going on. And uh, the problem with the law is that, uh, again, the government officers started like finding new ways to stall these RTI applications. So they sort of, sort of like, you know, blocked all the information and, on the other hand, deployed these like tactics of harassing activists and everything. And so far, like 12 activists have been killed because this law started like proving out to be a bit effective in terms of tackling corruption. But now when these new, of, new techniques were for, formed, to challenge this law or defeat this law, uh, you know, uh, it, it turns out that all the government responsibility schemes, social welfare schemes, failed in the last like 50 years of after the Indian independence. And you needed certain mechanisms and you needed some voice to tackle this particular problem and you didn't have that in the country. Uh, eventually this one guy, uh, you know, becomes, uh, he's a whistleblower and he was part of the government as an income tax officer who knew how the government was like, you know, tricking people, like this was very, they were just like working out system in their favor, and he just like quit his job and built this movement up uh, in India, particularly in the last five, six years. Um, but, and, and the thing was like, it, it, it was the, for the first time somebody was trying to bring this movement and make it collide with the government of India. Because so far the debate was, even, you know, the politician would say, yes, there is corruption in India we are going through corruption. But there wasn't any dialogue so far. So now there is a dialogue at this stage going on. And I think mass media is playing a huge role in that dialogue, even though this particular corruption movement which is going on for the last five, six years, uh, there are lots of people who are challenging it on, and when it comes to its model, like it's, they say it's anarchic. They are like not responsibly tackling the situation. But I think the biggest takeaway in this particular phenomenon is that they at least uh, managed to trigger some dialogue. Yeah, I think if I can follow on to if to what Mebub is saying, I mean, um, Mebub is referring to Arvind Kedrawal, who was the sort of founder of uh, what is now this kind of upstart third party known as the Am Admi Party, right. this sort of common man party in India. But I think it's interesting to go back to the beginning of this movement. So it starts with this right to information movement. So in, what, 2005, 2006, the government passes this right to information law, quite a landmark bit of legislation which is put in by the Congress party government that's still there. And for a lot of these activists, this is seen as a major breakthrough because now for the first time you have the right to petition your local government, your state government to get documents which previously would have been off limits. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll see as I walk through here that the, the history of this anti-corruption movement is kind of these advances and then there's a block and then they kind of look for a new way around it. So this Right to Information Act gives an enormous amount of hope and, and as Mebub has written, you can go look, there's a piece in Caravan, you know, eventually these people found that their efforts were being thwarted. And if you started filing these RTI requests, you would get harassed, the government would figure out ways to, you know, decline to answer. Um, even in cases where you got the documents and you could prove that a law had been broken, there were, you know, endless ways for the system to gum itself up to prevent the prosecution of a corrupt official or a corrupt lawmaker. So in 2010, again, to return to my theme of this international embarrassment, the Commonwealth Games, you know, which are like the Olympics for the old British colonies, come to India and they're massively humiliating. The, uh, you know, sort of like the Sochi hotels we all saw two weeks ago. None of the facilities are ready. Walkways are collapsing. You know, the roof of some, you know, gymnastics facility caves in. And this sparks these new protests because it turns out that the Polit politician who's part of the Congress party, who's the main organizer of this thing, has massively enriched himself along the way. And the new protest movement, again, says, look, RTI was not enough because once we catch people, the law does not prosecute them. They end up getting protected. So the new movement 
revolves around this idea that we need a new law that they call the John Lukpal Bill. Lukpal kind of means like ombudsman. So this is a people's ombudsman bill. And the law basically proposes that since the existing government and the existing set of laws cannot prosecute corrupt officials because they're all part of the same system, we need a kind of parallel government of highly moral individuals who will supervise all of these investigations. We need like an internal affairs department for the whole government. And this idea becomes the main driving point of all of these anti-corruption protests. So if you saw on the news in 2010, 2011, these huge fasts in India that were led by this kind of pseudo-Gandhian figure named Anna Hazare, um, this is all in favor of we want to put this bill through. And again, it's a kind of like weird technocratic faith that's, that's part of this. Like, first we need the RTI, and if we have RTI, that'll be like a good government thing, and we'll be able to uncover corruption. But now RTI is not working, so we need this look, Paul Bill. And they go as far as getting the parliament to consider the look, Paul Bill, but the kind of powers that be in politics kind of manage to checkmate them. So they say, okay, fine, we'll pass your bill, but like, first you have to sit down with us and negotiate out you know, the various different terms. And at the negotiating table, of course, the lawyers for the political parties run circles around these activists, and the bill gets watered down to almost nothing. And eventually what ends up happening is that the political parties essentially dare the anti-corrupt activists, come join us in politics. You know, they, they, for months and months and months, they say, look, we don't want any part of politics. Politics is corrupt. And the kind of the paradox is that the existing political parties force them to come into politics because that's the only way they can get what they want. And they form this new political party, the Ahmadmi Party. They do spectacularly well in the Delhi elections, which take place December or January of this year. And yet, now they're sort of in the quicksand. And I think we'll come back to talking a bit about this. They're part of the political system now. And so now anything they do that is politics is grounds for your hypocrites. You're not standing up for what you believe in. It's kind of, they've successfully been sort of dragged down to the level of the political parties that they loathe so much. What, what about, um, so I'm just kind of thinking about tying together uh, people's remarks so far. Um, at one level, you could, you could almost um, go to this argument that anti-corruption is a middle class movement, largely of professionals, of courts, of media. It sells always is a great media story. Um, but to what extent do ordinary folk um, in cities and in rural areas um, I mean, of course, they're aware of corruption. They encounter it maybe more often uh, than you know, middle class professionals do. Um, but to what extent are, is there kind of a linkage between you know, uh, the lack of, uh, you know, b between pollution, between the lack of safe food, between the lack of clean water, between land grabs, I'm thinking of rural China, and, and corruption? So my, my question, I guess, to rephrase it is, is this at all resonating uh, anywhere outside of cities and urban middle class professionals? Well, I think one of the things I was I was listening to your definition of corruption, and in you know government officials take getting ill gotten Not my gains definition. For, or the one <laughs> yes that that was out there, and what's interesting I think with with China, corruption and nepotism, or unfair use of family ties go together so tightly. In the 1989 protests of 25 years ago, the very first wall posters were about complaints of nepotism and the unfair advantage that um, children of, of the elite had. But recently, what definitely does resonate with ordinary people is, um, is are these stories that have been very strong on social media that um, Jia Young was talking about of somebody who breaks a law and says they can't touch me because of who my father is. Or um, corruption rolls together with um, it, calls for uh, complaints that high officials have um, been engaged in sexual assaults of young women and feel they're immune from persecution for it. So it fits into this whole thing. Both the making money fits into all these other things of having being above the law. So I think in some ways the anger at corruption is at this anger of people who feel that they don't have to be bound by the rules that, are, that bind everybody else. 
And I think that was when Bush Eli fell. He was accused of corruption and convicted of it, but a lot of the stories were about all kinds of other things he did mm -hmm. that, that blew him up and blew his wife up into this kind of case study in a lightning rod for all of the kinds of bad things that these people who stand above the law, who then come to stand for corruption, uh, are about. Um, on the other hand, I mean, I think, unfortunately, because corruption has been, I mean, has existed, I think, even from the founding of the PRC, I mean, I think in 51, like, of the three antis, there was, you know, anti-corruption and anti-waste, anti-bureaucratism. Um, I mean, so corruption has been with China through the 60s, you know, 70s, 80s, and there have been waves of uh, campaigns against it, many of them to no avail. But in the 70s and the early 80s, you know, when I was growing up in China, corruption, I mean, among people who are not princelings, who are just, you know, ordinary working class, it um, was there was such a culture of corruption that it became understood as a way of life, quite unfortunately. Um, so it wasn't regarded as a sin, um, you know, that, that at the time that you would write about on Weibo. This was just how you got things done. And, you know, I remember, you know, being a six-year-old. I mean, at the time, I went to first and second grade in China, and I knew that my mother had to go through the back door to get me into, um, into uh, first grade when I was six, you know, uh, at the age at the time for entrance was seven, but my mother very badly as tiger moms do wanted me to go um, at age six. And I think I knew about it at the time as a six-year-old. And did I, did, under, did I understand what bribery was? Did I understand that, you know, you know the, the, the ration stamps that she had to give up, you know, to, to make sure that her daughter got gotten to school? I mean, I don't think I understood the abstract concept, but I knew that she had to do something extra to get me in school. And that was just the way of life. I, you know, that there was no, I, you know, um, and for a long time, I don't, I never understood that as, you know, breaking, the breaking of a law. I understood that as just, you know, the things that people needed to do um, to, uh, to, you know, accomplish their goals. And unfortunately, I think through the 80s and 90s, that culture of corruption, you know, um, even at the low petty levels has grown, um, you know, so mundane that, um, you know, that, that uh, you really take something, you know, shocking um, for, you know, for, for people to bat a lash. And I think that's, um, and uh, you know, I think that's one of the, the the you know the casualties that you know people are just much less um, sensitized to the effects of corruption. I think taking a cue from Jiang's that you know there's always uh, there are always like these moments when when you see campaigns happening and breaking and happening. Same way in 1970s, like late 1970s, India you know saw this uh, massive campaign called JP Movement, which was a students' movement in Bihar first. And it, it just like morphed into a massive anti-corruption campaign. But as a result of that movement, what happened? The it culminated into a, a series of regional parties. They 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 also joined politics, and and these political parties started you know uh, campaigning not on the corruption. After a certain point, they began ca campaigning on caste, which is like different sort of like uh, these groups within the Hindu uh, you know mythology. Uh, so uh, there's upper caste, middle class, lower caste, and they started, you know, campaigning about that. And the central Indian belt is like largely dominated by caste system, and all, a lot of these parties, which which are functioning there, are based on caste. So they became caste-oriented parties, and these political parties like broke records. They sort of like colluded with the land mafia, liquor mafia, you know, lots of them are involved in murders and extortion and whatnot. Um, so it's in interesting, like, to see, like, what form does this campaign takes after a certain point. I mean, I'm not sure about what, what's going to be the form of this particular anti-corruption campaign which we are seeing in India at this stage. We don't know the result. It got into politics. It's out of politics now. I don't know where, where it's going to head to. Yeah, I think following on something both uh, Jiang and, and Mebub are suggesting, I mean, there's a cynical way of looking at this that says that corruption is the sort of highly moralized name we give to egregious acts in societies where the rule of law, broadly speaking, is not functioning. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine if you look at some of these big ticket corruption scandals in India in the past couple of years, they're basically, 
the byproducts of government policies where corruption is essentially inevitable. So uh, one of the biggest scams in India in the past couple of years, Mehboob has written a bit about this, and I've edited several articles about it, was something called Colgate. So the nature of Colgate was that, um, a catchy name, was that the government of India continued to own uh, what they called captive coal mines. So these are coal mines that are not being used at the moment, and the government wants to allot them to productive industries. So, you know, let's say you want to build a steel plant, you can apply to the government and they'll give you exclusive access to one of these coal mines. So the premise here is that we're going to favor certain businesses that need these coal mines for, you know, what we deem to be productive enterprises, and we're going to lease them out for free to whoever wants them. So. If you look at a policy that's set up that way, and no one seemed to have a problem with this, you're essentially guaranteeing corruption, right? I mean, you don't have to call it corruption, but you're setting up a series of allocations of natural resources to private corporations in a way where there is no science. There's, you know, it's all on the discretion of whoever's making the decision. So however you do that, it's going to be corrupt. Um, and I think so much of what happens in the interaction between the Indian political sphere and the Indian sort of private sphere, whether that's kind of individual citizens or big businesses, basically falls under this aegis of corruption. It's kind of a priori corrupt. Uh, and so the question then becomes, how do we figure out which of these things to be outraged about and which of these things to regard as like, well, that's kind of business as usual and maybe we don't want to get so fussed up about it? I think one, one thing, going back to an earlier thing about the kind of possibility for an, an, anti -corrupt, an anti corruption group that then becomes part of the political system in India, the contrast in China has been that any efforts to do any organizing, even very low level organizing around a topic like this that the government claims a monopoly over leads to um, imprisonment and breakdown because the government is so worried about any alternative organizational forms. So one of the real ironies of the last few months is there have both been high profile anti-corruption moves and trials beginning and also trials of um, activist lawyers and we just had um, a piece in the um, Dissent Online Edition by Nic Nicholas Cavell, who's here, on the imprisonment of um, a lawyer, Xu Yong, who, among other things, was trying to get through more transparency laws and things that would um, operate to try to rein in corruption. So the government's both saying, we make it an absolute priority to rein in corruption, and talking in a different register, are, are working to rein in people who are actually trying to do things to expose corruption. Mm -hmm. So it's not about co-opting these people into the system. It's taking activists who say they want to not be out and out dissidents, but actually work within the system to improve it, and then they're excising them from all political life. Right. We've had a great set of remarks uh, up to now from our panelists. Let's hear from you all. Um, Christina, is the, are the, do we have roving mics uh, available, uh, I believe? Can we get those uh, circulated? And uh, who'd like to start us off? Yes, uh, Arvind. And, and if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself to the rest of us. Hi, then. I'm Arvind Rajagopal. I teach at NYU. Uh, thanks very much for this very illuminating set of uh, remarks. I'm just curious. I mean, so many of you, certainly the last few remarks that Jonathan made and Jeff made, suggest that both corruption and anti-corruption are labels that disguise class lines. Now, here you've got India and China. One country has advanced through a revolution, the other through the avoidance of a revolution. And they both appear to converge this moment of globalization in a form of politics, which is, in the ways that you describe it, strikingly similar. So uh, any thoughts about this? I mean, wh what's going on here? What I think is interesting about the Kedrawal movement or the Hazare movement or now the Ahmadmi party is that um, it definitely began, I think, indisputably as a kind of paradigmatic middle class uprising, right? I mean, it was a, there's a great piece by Partha Chatterjee where he points out that, 
it is the, the paradoxically, it is a populist campaign that is also anti-politics. So unlike your normal populist campaign, which seeks to sort of use politics to get some of the spoils for the people, here we're kind of, the people are saying, no, politics is the enemy, the political class is the enemy. What I think surprised a lot of people, particularly as they formed the party and contested elections in Delhi, was that these middle class complaints, you know, what, what one, uh, one writer memorably referred to them as sort of residence welfare association politics, right? If you're not familiar with India, this is sort of like your, your co-op board or your kind of neighborhood, you know, we want to keep squatters out of the neighborhood kind of thing. Um, really trickled down in a way to people who, you know, auto rickshaw drivers, right, was the example that you kept seeing in Delhi. So it was a surprise, I think, to a lot of people that lower classes, at least in the cities, and how well this is reverberated in rural areas, I don't really know, but the lower classes had the same level of disgust with the political process. I think part of that is a post-economic reform thing that, you know, the the connections that used to tie kind of lower class communities to certain politicians who could hand out patronage and spoils have frayed a bit over time. And I think as that has happened, and as the sort of material expectations of the lower classes have increased, they are much more susceptible to these kind of traditionally middle class political rhetoric, uh, you know, rhetoric that, that, that wasn't the case before. That's my kind of hypothesis. I don't know if Mehboob has think, seen think other it, things I here. Think, I think it has also changed one thing, which was the, the rhetoric, the election campaigns which had happened in the past in India were largely communal or caste-based. Like they would talk about, oh, Pakistan is our enemy. We need to crush Pakistan and we have to be together. All the Hindus have to be together in order to. So that actually, you know, drew a lot of attention uh, and also vo vote base was based on that. Like, you know, people would campaign on the base of religion or, or the wars which, have, which they have fought in the past. In last particularly 10 years, you don't see that happening quite often. I mean, in, in central India where Mayawati, which was this caste politician, was very big. She lost the elections not because uh, she she was a she was not doing well. She was she was a, she was a corrupt. Like she she was involved in a lot of scams. And the same way, uh, uh, BJP changed the entire uh, you know uh, the entire focus of its politics. It's more development driven now. It talks about you know bringing in uh, reforms and also uh, you know helping to build the country and take it to the next level, which is uh, aspiring to be a superpower. Um, uh, I think that's that it has changed the whole uh, debate. It's more about now like how you would want to make the lives of people better rather than, you know. Well, I wonder actually if this is a borrowing from China, this idea of this sort of developmental, na development as an idiom of nationalism. That's sort of, you know, what's going to, we need to make this country, it's a sort of fundamentally nationalist urging, but development is what's going to do it, you know. We're going to express our greatness not necessarily in, you know, Hindu civilizational terms, but by building this great country. Well, it's interesting. The one moment to bring discussion of China and India together with corruption, um, and I should say to preface this that I'm very dismissive of anybody who goes to, to China for one week and then writes or speaks as though they had knowledge about it. So I'm going to base my talks, my remarks here on the week I spent in India. <laughs> but um, I went there right after the Commonwealth Games that Jonathan referred to that had been, uh, and I was on panels comparing the Commonwealth Games to mega events in China. Now mega events, hosting these big events are one way that countries seek to assert a place for themselves in that kind of developed world top tier. And we've seen countries in the global south moving that way with greater and lesser success, whether it was the World Cup in South Africa that went relatively well, or the Commonwealth Games in India that went badly. Um, China was seen in some ways as, okay, a success story with the um, way that the Olympics went. But when I was at a panel um, in Delhi about comparing the mega events, one of the things that came up was the saying, well, one of the things about the Commonwealth Games was this enormous corruption that we became aware of in the way that contract, was there something like that in China? And the response that the China people on the panels had to say is, there wasn't the open discussion of it in the newspapers that there was in India. And so if you're looking at kind of metrics, one of the real differences where China clearly lags behind is the ability to have 
this kind of public, that, th that kind of public discussion in the newspapers. And there clearly couldn't have been the public forum that we were all taking part in to compare China and India in this way. There doubtless was tons of corruption with the, with the, the building projects and contracts, but it wasn't something that could come out. So that's a way in which, yes, there are ways in which globalization provides some of kind of tie new kinds of opportunities for corruption, new kinds of dynamics. And just finally, one of the one of the things corruption is taking on an international cast in China. There have been reports about um, Western financial firms trying very hard to court children of the Chinese elite. And so that's a way in which corruption is really Chinese corruption is more than just China now. Um, yes. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your remarks. Um, my name is Jason Ng. I'm a research fellow at the University of Toronto. And I guess my question is uh, specifically with regards to mass media, as some of you all alluded to. And uh, particularly, I guess I'm going to use an example of China, but I, I would love to hear also about how it affects India. But uh, essentially, what is what are the lessons that governments have learned about how to control these sorts of corruption cases within media? So I guess particularly with regards to Bo Xilai, and we saw how uh, censorship and the sort of um, issues regarding the control of the message sort of spread out of control on social media, on the internet, and there was you know, levels of censorship and there were uh, efforts to control the message, but for the most part, it seems like the government wasn't in control at the start of that um, scandal. And so now, have there lessons to be learned from that with regards now to what's happening with Zhou Yun Kong and this now recent take down, you know, seemingly a setup to take him down as well. Um, what has China, you know, are there are there new approaches that we see the government taking with regards to Joe? Um, uh, this, that's, I think, a really interesting and relevant question. Um, with regards to, you know, you know, tackling it on mass media, I think the government, the Chinese government is learning um, that having an army of censors isn't enough. I mean, they are not, I mean, they're not removing that army of censors, but simply scrubbing the internet sometimes um, fuels the fire, as it were. So um, what I've seen is the government will try to, um, you know, will, will, will try to rev up momentum to, uh, for a story that, um, you know, takes on a different angle that, you know, um, Praises something that the government is doing, or you know, offers a counterexample. Um, so rather than trying to you know douse out this fire, I think the government wants to start another fire and kind of attract attention away from um, from the story that is an, that is an embarrassment to um, to the government. I think with the Boisilai trial, um, you know, at the start of the trial, there was a lot of speculation about how open the court would be and whether you know any journalists would be allowed whether the transcripts would be um you know would be revealed and i think um the govern i think the government made a very calculated move of um of uh, giving both you know the chinese people and foreign media the semblance of a relatively open court um you know transcripts were revealed i mean it was you know, then seeing that there were certain sections that were deleted, but um, but I think you know immediately following the trial, people were surprised that you know that uh, Bo had been you know allowed to defend defend himself um, at least to an extent. I mean, all of that didn't really change the outcome. I mean, he's re uh, received a life um, sentence, but I think uh, I think this is a quite prudent move. Um, on, on, on the part of the party to give the people, you know, um, you know, the, the semblance of having, you know, some, um, you know, idea of what's going on and, uh, um, and uh, you know, and also uh, eyes into, you know, the courtroom, but at the end of the day, not really altering the verdict. Um, I think that's kind of a new measure that the, that the government's taking. Question from Lily in the back. Uh, hi, my name is Lily Ling. I teach here in the International Affairs Program. I'd like to question uh, an assumption that has not been questioned so far, which is that when you talk about corruption, uh, there is the, um, the assumption that somehow 
the law is being corrupted, and that's what corruption is. But what about the fact that the law itself is corrupt? And that's why there is corruption. In other words, there is no legitimacy to the kinds of laws that are set up. That's why you mentioned you know, that corruption is a way of life. Cor corruption, so-called, is a way of life because the system of law is itself corrupt and unfair and skewed towards the privileged members of society. By the way, very much like here. And if we're going to talk about corruption, what about the corruption right across the bridge? You know, the George Washington Bridge, New Jersey's been in the news a lot, right? So what I would like to do is to challenge our understanding of politics and law and not take politics and law as assumed to be objective or fair or somehow legitimate. If the, the process of politics itself is not legitimate, then of course you're going to have deviations from it. Because if you don't question this assumption, then automatically all emergent societies that have experienced colonialism will be corrupt because the system of politics that was imposed upon them was illegitimate to begin with, and subsequent developments have been amendments on that illegitimate system. Um, and if we look at politics in the industrialized West, we find ample cases of corruption. So that's, so I'd like to question that assumption because too often these discussions of corruption in India and China tend to contain the con corruption in India, China, as if there is some sort of inherent fault of society or culture there and not taking the larger historical and international context into consideration. Thank you. I think, I mean, this, um, I think I mentioned earlier, I'm not sure what the context was, uh, Partha Chatterjee writing about this on a Hazare, Arvind Kedrawal movement as being a sort of anti-political movement. Um, I don't know, there's, a, there's some other Chatterjee work where he talks about this notion of political society, which is something that he opposes to civil society, right? So he says civil society is essentially a middle class kind of NGO sort of politics. And political society, in his definition, and he uses India as an example, is the way in which communities of people come together to sort of lobby politicians or to lobby government for sort of exceptions to the law or to unjust laws. So the, his sort of main example is imagine a community of squatters who are sort of living in a railway area in Calcutta, and by any objective application of the law, they shouldn't be there, but they've lived there for a very long time, and they vote, and they're members of this democracy, so they're going to be able to go to a politician and say, look, why don't we cut a deal whereby you can kind of regularize our living here, and in exchange, we will continue to vote for you. And, you know, I think your question points right at this, that politics in India, in my experience, well, I say in my experience as if I was participating, but as an observer closely, um, are heavily transactional because you have these massive inequalities and you have, you know, what are often referred to, middle class people in India often refer derisively to the idea of a vote bank. Now, a vote bank in this context is something like the way you might say in America, African Americans tend to vote for the Democratic Party. In India, this is looked upon as a kind of scandal by middle class people, that you know, people of a certain caste or a certain community in a certain area will tend to vote for a politician who either is from that caste or community or has treated them well in the past. To a middle class person, this is seen as a sort of perversion of you know, the kind of enlightened Western democracy we want. I have always presumed that to one of the voters participating in this arrangement, this is a perfectly rational and sensible way to get the sort of big, bad, unfriendly government to give you a few crumbs. So I think you're right. We have to be careful when we're talking about corruption not to assume that the sort of normal way of doing business is pure as driven snow and corruption is a kind of perversion of that. I mean, I think the question of how we decide to call certain things corruption and certain things politics is a very good area for inquiry. I think in China as well, I mean, just the idea of law itself, is, it's still very tenuous. I mean, going back, uh, I mean, you know, uh, to, to, you know, 3,000 years, I mean, there was always this tension between the, the legalists, you know, the rule, of, um, the rule of law or the rule of man. And um, because, you know, Confucian kind of ethics has, all, has followed more the rule of man, um, 
leadership sometimes has always arisen by you know one by you know by by the cult of one person and that you know is passed on and I think you know that's nowhere more evident than in you know than in uh, in, than in Mao who um, you know never you know did not uh, made no effort to really stipulate laws. It was really by you know his whims and that you know many of um, you know this past century's greatest catastrophes or um, or were wreaked. I think uh, in terms of um, you know law in China, I mean even for the ordinary person, I think the understanding of law or constitution is um, is 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 very ill defined, and I think that's something that China really um, needs to work on, and you know and and many. Um, and many, you know, intellectuals and um, liberals have, you know, fought for a more, um, you know, more solid rule of law. But I do think the idea of law, of a constitution, is not, you know, as um, deeply ingrained in the minds of Chinese as it is in, um, you know, as, as Americans or in those in the West. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say that I think in comparative discussions, it's it's important to not think that there are black and white contrasts between, you know, sex, uh, between societies, but there are different fault lines or points that that make things very different, including the fact that with the issues of the George Washington Bridge, there could then be a robust public discussion of it afterwards, and that that you could imagine a similar discussion happening with different political figures belonging to different political factions being called out, whereas in China, this just doesn't happen with exposure in the media would be cut down if it were somebody in, in one faction. And also, I think the, the weak link in the American system, even though family ties matter a lot in American politics, we've had two Bushes after all and, you know, and so forth, um, the fault line in American politics toward corruption is partly people cycling in and out of, between government and the private sector. And you could talk a lot if you were having a discussion here about corruption in America and ineffective efforts to root it out. What we'd spend a lot of time talking about, I'd hope, would be things like lobbyists who are in government and then cycle out of government and are using their past connections with the government. That's, that's just a different structure of corruption than people who are different members of a, a family group with extended things. So not that the same thing doesn't go on, but I think some of the dynamics are quite distinctively different in different settings. Okay, over here. As that's going down, I'll also say we have a Supreme Court that decided that corporations are people, so maybe they don't need to. <laughs> they can just spend money and speak freely like people, and they don't need to rotate in and out of government anymore. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Gareth Sweeney. I'm the chief editor of the Global Corruption Report, uh, Transparency International. <laughs> and uh, I, on that note, I'd thank just you like for to coming. qualify that. <laughs> Um, we do, in fact, work on private sector corruption almost as much as public sector corruption. But corruption by its nature um, uh, the, is, a perce is perceptions based, and that survey tends yeah. to draw the most media attention because we're ranking countries. Mm -hmm. Even we recognize the limitations of, of that survey, but it tends to give the perception that we work mostly on public sector corruption, which is not the case. But if I could ask two very, or not only the case, if I could ask two quick questions, one on India and one on at China. In relation to India with Kedrival, you, you mentioned very briefly that they were in politics and, and now they're out of politics. Um, my impression with Kedrival and the AAP is that um, really it was of his volition. It wasn't a case of being drawn in, but I, I really believe that he felt that this was the, what was required in order to change the political system in India. They need to be part of the decision-making process. That's. Uh, um, but he immediately walked away from that as soon as he came across his first hurdle, as far as I could see. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, maybe I should clarify what I, what I meant. Uh, at the beginning, you know, I think it's important to, to remember that the idiom was always anti-political. So he, he had set out from the beginning to define himself and his movement as opposed to everything that politics and the political class stood for. And inched slowly but surely toward further involvement. So you had in the fall of 2011 was the big huge protest. Then they had the kind of prolonged negotiation over what would go in the bill, and the Congress party basically checkmated them. In the beginning of 2012, 
Kedrawal sort of dipped a toe into politics by saying that India Against Corruption, which was his movement, would endorse certain candidates in kind of upcoming special elections. And that didn't really work very well. And so it was kind of only at that point, I mean, I think you're right that he may have seen from the beginning that he wanted to get into politics. But I think it's important to see it as the political parties realizing, I think quite cannily, I mean, you know, the Congress party in India is good at winning elections. It's not good at much else, but, but that's what it knows how to do. They knew that the only way to neutralize the threat of Kedrawal, which may have backfired, was to bring him into the muck, basically. And he, at some point, decided he had no choice but to go along and has been fairly successful. I think he's not, I wouldn't say he's out of politics right now. They're, no, that's they're actually gearing up question, to fight yeah. the next elections. That's actually my question, whether, I mean, he entered into politics, suddenly he's the chief minister of Delhi, and I think it's useful to clarify that that's as far as their political influence extends now. Yeah. But leading up to the election, he stood down. Was this him throwing out his, you know, his toys, or is he gearing up for the prime ministerial to be, to be prime minister. I think but a lot of people have started seeing it as a big leap that Kejriwal is going to take if he's going to get into the parliamentary elections. And the common perception, uh, people who actually voted for him, well, a lot of them is, uh, uh, we gave him a chance in Delhi elections. And uh, uh, there was just like r lots of like newspaper reports about him being like uh, not able to control the law and order and being in constant tussle with police and uh, the local government, you know, other, other, other sort of like central government uh, people, uh, which di didn't go well, I guess. Uh, I don't know, like, what do you think about that? Did it go yeah, well? I, I think this is, I mean, the paradox of it is that, you know, it's an anti-politics movement in many ways, but the only way to actually make some headway in a country where politics is the dominant idiom of public participation is to yourself get into politics. But you'll see um, particularly, you know, I hope none of you spend as much time as I do tracking online arguments in the Indian sort of social media sphere. Um, the right wing in India loathes Kedrawal with the fire of a thousand suns because they recognize that he is the biggest threat to them. So the Congress party right now is seen as basically all but dead, and the BJP, uh, which is the sort of Hindu nationalist right party, center right, however you want to put it, um, is looking to sort of march to victory in the next elections. And along comes this Kedrawal, who says sort of a pox on both your houses to both the Congress and the BJP. And BJP supporters, um, who are quite dominant because of, you know, the online world is sort of a middle class and above sphere, uh, immediately turn their vitriol. They used to spend all of their time attacking Rahul Gandhi and Sonia Gandhi and the Congress Party dynasty. Now sort of 80% of their hate is directed at Kedrawal. Kedrawal's a hypocrite. Kedrawal said he didn't want a, an official house to live in when he was chief minister, but we found a document saying he was going to live in a house, you know. Kedrawal's minister claimed that he, you know, would never do this, but oh, we've got tape of him doing this, you know. So this sort of idea now that they're in politics, they're part of the dirt. Uh, and, and the other political parties, quite cleverly, are saying, look, they're just as dirty as we are, you know, which is taking away the one thing that they had going for them. Uh, it's, I think it's a fascinating dynamic, right? Um, it's, you have to imagine, right, if Ralph Nader sort of made it into, you know, the, the, the runoff of an American presidential election, you would have to guess that one of the first things that would happen would be all this dirt would start getting dug up, you know, oh, hey, didn't he take money from this guy? Or, you know, we're noticing these are suspiciously well-produced ads he's making kind of or stuff. Or he it's turned his heat up to 70 degrees, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. He's, he's using a plane to fly back and forth, isn't that, you know, contrary to, so that kind of stuff is, is what's happening. I just had one quick question, very quick question on China. Are you concerned that the anti-corruption reform mov re movement there within government may be misused to target undesirables? Once slurred as corrupt within the higher echelons of power, in the absence of an independent judiciary, it's very difficult then to, it may be very difficult to get rid of that tag. So do you see that as a concern? Well, it's definitely being, I mean, it's definitely being misused. I don't think there's, uh, I mean, there are all kinds of ways in which it's, it's really, uh, uh, it becomes an instrument to go after political rivals. And actually the government kind of needs to do that to deflect away from a perception that this is something systemic. 
I mean, they're the, 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 and there is a widespread belief among, or there's a, often a, a degree of widespread belief or acceptance in the fact that there is corruption uh, throughout the Communist Party by a lot of people. But the more that the attention of the most execrable things are directed away from the center, the more useful it is to the center. So there's actually a value to the center of kind of sensationalizing some of the things. And back to the, the way the story of Bo Xi Lai was spun, I'm not sure that the government ever lost that much control of the story if you think about the audience it cares most about, which are not people who are fine-graining fine reading even social media and seeing the, dis, the disparities between the released transcript and the other. They're really most concerned about the largest audience that's being reached by things like television, by things, by what relatively, relatively not engaged and informed people are going to, going to think. And so from that, I think they, they, to a certain extent, held control of that, that story and managed to pile onto it a lot of things that made, that created the idea that these were real miscreants, not just kind of ordinary members of the system being weeded out. I think just to, to follow with one thing, I mean, I think we haven't talked about this directly compar in, a, in a comparative way. I think a fascinating difference between the Chinese and the Indian situations here is that because you have a competitive two-party or multi-party system in India, the immediate imperative for a political party, one of whose members is accused of corruption, is to defend that person. You know, I mean, there's the occasional someone can occasionally screw up so badly that they have to get hung out to dry. But the idea is that if you don't mount a strenuous defense of your guilty guy, your political opponents are going to just take it to the bank. Uh, and I think that's so different listening to you guys talk about the Chinese situation. You don't have in India a situation where, um, you know, the Congress party at the center will ditch a chief minister in one of the states because he's corrupt. I mean, there's a famous situation in the state of Karnataka, which was for a long time the only BJP stronghold in the South. Um, and there was a very corrupt chief minister named Yeti Yurapa, and they held on to this guy as long as they possibly could. And the only thing that, that made them cut him loose was that the Congress was just hammering them you know, week in and week out, there were these huge central corruption scams, and the Congress people were like, well, yeah, we, we have corrupt guys, but look at this guy in Karnataka, he's terrible. And finally, after a huge fight inside the BJP, they decide to cut the guy loose, they lose the next elections to the Congress, and I'm not sure what the most recent news is, but I'm pretty sure he's coming back, yeah. because it turns out also that people who are corrupt tend to be very good at getting voters to vote for them. You know, this is... Um, in there's Bridge. a there's a you know wonderful academic in DC a guy named Milan Vaishnav who studies criminality in Indian politics and you know something every time there's an Indian election you'll see these stories in the international press that point out how many candidates have charge sheets against them or how many candidates have been charged with crimes previously and we all tut tut and say oh god what a country you know 200 people in the congress you know in the parliament are are guilty of some crime but, you know, there's a really good incentive, again, going back to this question of what's normatively, what's corruption and what's not, there's a huge incentive for political parties to nominate these people because they tend to be very good at getting votes. And, and you know, you want to know why they're in politics, it's because they're successful. They also distribute liquor. Yes, yeah, I mean, it's, right. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jessica Biss. I work at the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. Um, I, was, I have a question about India, since it's not my strength. Um, in China, obviously, um, kind of social, me social media and the blogosphere plays a role in kind of helping the government um, catch the flies, not the tigers, not the big guns. And I mean, there's examples of, you know, netizens and bloggers who I don't know why they were there or how they, you know, got the scoop, but there'll be, there's a picture of the, I think he was like a Shanxi low-level official. He was at the scene of a horrible car accident and they, he was caught smiling and that was of course at first an outrage, but then someone noticed that he had a really, really nice watch on his wrist and how could a local official afford, you know, a $100,000 watch? So, and then there's, you know, sex tapes being released and so, I mean, the social blogosphere is kind of doing the work 
for the government and kind of taking out some of these people. I was wondering if there's a similar kind of phenomenon going on in India, if that type of stuff happens, or if it's still more of, like you mentioned, political parties, um, political um, kind of more heavyweights fighting each other in the in the so kind of the social media world and taking each other out that way. You wanna, I, I, I think the media, I mean, I'll let you, I think the media is, is what plays this role. I, you're talking about watches. I've interviewed a lot of people, like low-rung bureaucrats who don't get more than like $1,000 a month as a salary, they have like, the, a lot of them have these like really fancy Rado watches, like, you know, worth a lot, you know, $5,000, $10,000. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's that thing is, is actually there. I mean, you know, when it, when it comes to uh, all these like low level officers, uh, the, 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 needs are, the needs are different. The needs are that they have to live in a, in a big house and then they have to have a nice car and uh, they have to have this like official protocol wherein uh, they need a peon, um, they need five peons in, in the office and uh, there's like a lot of disconnect between an official and local people. They, they fear, you know, the, there's a fear when, 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 this, when a bureaucrat goes to a village for a visit. These villagers, like, are scared of talking to him because there's so much of, like, decorum. They kind of, like, just want to stay away from it. So I, I guess there's this disconnect, and they, 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 they glorify themselves by having these expens this expensive stuff and, you know, uh, with them. I hope that answers your question. Like taking bribe and stuff. I think it's. I, I think in India the media is pretty hyperactive about this stuff. I mean, as someone was asking earlier about how, you know, how the media, how the Chinese Communist Party has kind of parried some of these things. I mean, I think in India the political parties have found themselves uh, really without good answers to managing the media. Um, so even things that are, you know, I was t talking earlier about this Colgate scam and about this 2G scam, you know, I these are scams, but they frankly also followed rather naturally from policies that were put in place by the government. But the government was quite inept at explaining, look, we put this policy in place for a certain reason and it didn't really work out the way we hoped it would. Um, I think the media is really, you know, there's a, there's a, Corruption is one of those things that no one ever defends, right? It's kind of a, it's a, it's an evil that that doesn't have any any defenders. So any media organization is always going to go for a kind of corruption story. It's it's it, that's the gold standard of a kind of sting operation that an Indian TV channel would conduct. Um, and I think it's the, the sort of the low level stuff of you know the bureaucrat who's got the nice house or the nice car. That's almost seen as so commonplace as to not really warrant much much attention. Um, it's sort of bigger ticket stuff. Or or if if a bureaucrat gets in trouble for something else, then you'll find these stories start coming out. Arvind, yeah, uh, just to add to that, uh, the uh, in the Indian media context, you know, for a long time when there were popular protests and popular movements, the the tradition on the part of the media when they covered it in the news was to portray it in terms of a disruption to prevailing order. So the media, news media, has historically been very anti-movement, anti, you know, anti-people, so to speak, because the state was really the anchor of its authority. Now, what's interesting the last very few years, really, is that suddenly the tables have turned and the media are thoroughly pro-protest. And uh, so I was just thinking about this, and I've been looking at some of the... Uh, uh, you know, Price, Waterhouse, Cooper, uh, you know, the Librand, they, they produce these media and entertainment industry uh, reports, annual reports. And I was not surprised to find there that the Anna Hazare anti-corruption movement is listed among its credits for the year 2012. The uh, Delhi rape protests are listed among its credits for the year 2013. Uh, and they have, uh, they mentioned this conclave, you know, Jawaharlal Nehru's vision, a tryst with destiny, uh, a billion, engaging a billion consumers. So the vision is that today's protester is tomorrow's consumer. At least that's, that seems to be the model there. The media, some, of, some of the people in the media industry may be working with. That, that's kind of interesting.
Well, I, I mean, to my mind, this you see this as, you know, these were middle class movements in a way. And, and I don't know, you might have to go back to the JP movement, which, which Mebub mentioned, um, which is 74, 75, to find the last big middle class movement. Or maybe there was sort of anti-reservation, kind of anti-affirmative action protests in the 90s that really, that really got a lot of middle class attention. We, we did a big piece in Caravan that was a profile of kind of the most popular and most polarizing TV host in India, a guy named Arnab Goswami. He's basically the Bill O'Reilly of India. That's a very, very good way to think about it. And one of the people who worked for him told us a, a phenomenal story where this fellow on a Hazare was starting to get ready to do this kind of protest. And there was a bit of dead time, you know, like, oh, we need to have like a couple of minutes to fill in the broadcast. And one of his producers puts together a little piece about this guy on a Hazare, you know, who's, again, fashions himself as like a Gandhian. He's wearing kind of a topi. He fasts until death. And Arnob, the host, our Bill O'Reilly character, says, you know, after this airs, is furious with this woman. He says, what the hell are you doing? You know, I hate these people, these Jolawalas, which is what, like, the Indian kind of, you know, hippie kind of activist type. Messed you know, up journalists. Yeah, we don't need these Berkeley types. You know, I don't want any of this. And then two days later, he's got, Hazare's got this big protest, and there are all of these middle class people there, and Arnab comes into work, and he tells everyone, we're going to do 12 hours of Ana Hazare today, <laughs> you know? This is making people mad. I mean, again, it's like network or something, you know? Yes. People are furious, they wanna see this, I want 10 trucks there, and we're gonna do Ana Hazare around the clock. And the media, again, because corruption is seen as this nonpartisan issue, the, the media goes all out for this stuff. So you have like the Times of India, which owns this network, telling people, call this number and leave a message of support for Ana Hazare. You know, um, you have, you know, just full bore. And this is something as, as the anti-corruption movement has transitioned into a political party, this is something that the other political parties are now outraged by because they accuse the media of favoring the anti-corruption party. So it's, I think as the middle class comes to be, these aren't peasant movements or farmers movements, they're middle class movements, and the media sees that as, you know, that's gonna bring us high ratings. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Jia Jian Ying, I'm a writer, journalist, and also work for Indian China Institute. Uh, I have a question uh, related to the um, new forms and scales of corruption in, um, in China in particular. Um, uh, because I, as I was listening to you uh, talking about um, corruption in different countries, different cultures, and, and um, Lily's question about you know, the law, I um, remember that when Enron uh, scandal first broke out in the 1990s, I was um, researching stories in, in China about some entrepreneurs, and they were uh, having this aha moment to say, hey, we've been having this bad name of, you know, all Chinese businesses are corrupt, but now it turns out, you know, uh, after Enron that we're just uh, very crude in our forms of corruption, and the more sophisticated corruption takes place in the U.S., mm -hmm. and they're ahead of us, <laughs> uh, you know. So thinking about that, uh, and after the 2008 financial crisis and, you know, people began to talk about that, you know, the Wall Street uh, uh, firms are really corrupt, but they're so sophisticated that it's hard to uh, prosecute and no one got really punished. Um, then this also brings to mind about the more recent phenomena about some of these firms courting or hiring the sons and daughters of uh, these Chinese, um, you know, princelings, and a lot of them are involved in these deals and into finance. And also recently, I heard almost something like two thirds of the new students in at Columbia University's finance, uh, you know, course are Chinese. They're like really flocking to the U.S. Uh, they want to do do uh, MBA. They want to do finance. So I'm just wondering what you think uh, about, the, would this be possible uh, as a new coming form, new forms of big scale, big tickets, uh, corruption in, in some ways, mm. um, that would involve both American firms and Chinese, um, you know, middle class children or high, you know, princelings? Wow, still learning from the West, right? In certain <laughs> areas, this. 
Um, no, that's 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 really interesting. And and there is actually, I mean, one of the critiques of um, critiques or things that circulate in Chinese popular culture is, uh, you know, a sense that some of the really enormous corruption isn't what's being discovered, you know, that there are things that are really big out there. And Han Han, who's been a very popular and sometimes controversial blogger, had this one very in who writes in a mode sometimes that's a little bit like uh, Stephen Colbert for China, where he takes on a thing. And one was he talked about a local official who was being persecuted for corruption. And he says, actually, this is a very good official. Because look at how small his takeaway was. He only had three mistresses. He didn't have 10. He's a really pure guy, and he only, you know, he only made five times his regular salary. He's really a model. We should all try to be more like him. So there is this notion that, you know, that, that what you get in corruption scandals that come to light is just the tip of the iceberg. And I think that's why it took me a while to figure out why there was so much anger and outrage and you know trying to crack down on the foreign media describing these enormous sums being made by members of the the um Wen Jiabao family and Xi Jinping one because people knew that there was a lot of widespread corruption so it wasn't really a revelation so why was there so much anxiety about it but just the scale and the enormity of it and i think then after that the notion of a kind of entwinement with international forms, I think that is something that um, the Chinese Communist Party does worry about as something that would be delegitimating even with everything else going on. But yeah, you're describing a worrisome like increased sophistication by borrowing worst practices, right, around the world. So it's um, definitely something we'll have to watch. And I think it's also dangerous because, I mean, then you get to the very blurry line of, you know, what is corruption, like where does corruption emerge on, you know, politics or like just really slick dealings? And I'm not sure if, and I mean, I, and I think the, the um, what's dangerous about it is that the laws are, you know, are there sophisticated enough laws at this point to govern um, sort of corruption that, uh, that, 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 is, that exists in that very gray area between, you know, what's like, you know, what's legal and what's, what's not legal. I mean, the spirit of it is obviously um, illegal, but, you know, do we, you know, but do we have the letter to kind of to, to, to be able to persecute someone and say this is something, you know, that's, um, that's definitively wrong. So I think we do get into that very tricky terrain, and this is why I think, um, you know, laws um, and improvement, uh, you know, uh, of these laws are, 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 are so essential. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Synthesizing a few other questions we've had, um, I wanted to ask what the lessons learned by um, by Western media are. You know, all of our panelists here. Um, you know, if if uh, you know corruption is so ubiquitous, if it can cross borders, um, uh, you know, if there are um, you know questions about how to define it, like what metrics should be used, like the finances, um, you know, moved in gray areas. Um, essentially, um, you know what. You know, going forward, like, is it just a faster metabolism that's needed to cover anti-corruption movements, or like, are there like specific metrics? Um, we had the Transparency International, um, you know, uh, fellow talking about, um, you know, potentially useful figures. I mean, what 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 is most useful going forward? Um, well, I think I mean something I can say um, on the basis of my experience working as a journalist in India is that something that makes this difficult, and Mebub and I work together on a, on a lot of stories, and I think we found this over and over again, is that you have, broadly speaking, a low transparency environment. So you're not, you know, I used to make this joke that the best investigative journalists in India were the CBI and the NIA, which are India's equivalent of the FBI and the sort of CIA. Um, because they alone had the power to subpoena documents, to compel politicians to talk, to for and and if you read the Indian newspapers, you will invariably find that big stories about corruption or illegality have been leaked from these investigative agencies. So 
you don't have, and I don't know, I assume in China the situation is even more difficult, you, it's, it's incredibly hard to get at information that someone does not want you to have. Um, and I think in that low transparency environment, the political parties or the government finds it far easier than we would see in the U.S. to exert control over what can and can't be in the media. Um, and also finds it easy, I think, when there's an adverse story in the media to come out and blame the media for having reported it, to say there's no way you could have known this, this is fabricated, my political enemy must have paid you to carry this story, you know. So I think, you know, one thing that is so difficult in these situations where, you know, you have a bit of a rule of law problem and you also have a kind of messy public discourse is that it's very hard to get sort of solid ground to stand on. Everything is quicksand a little bit. So, you know, my allegation is is not any stronger than your counter allegation. Even if I have documents, you know, you might say, well, you fabricated those documents. Um, or, you know, these documents are a frame up kind of thing. It's, I think it's, that's, that's one of the things that's very difficult. And some Western news organizations have tried a little bit harder to get around this. Um, but by and large, unlike in China, where I think you've had Bloomberg and the New York Times, um, and I'm sure you guys could name a lot of others, really doing pioneering work. I'm not sure any Western news organization has broken really big stories in India that I can recall. And one of the one of the distressing things, if, if you'd asked, I mean, a year ago, even I might have said that there seemed to be a, a, a somewhat positive trend in China for the central authorities allowing a little more leeway for reporting with, by by quite brave Chinese journalists to uncover uh, to weed out stories of of um, corrupt land deals and things like that in the locale, and because they don't have the, the doing the work of, of government investigators, but there actually there have been moves toward I mean almost all the positive things you can think about there have been there have been some moves backward in the last year in terms of transparency in China. There's been a reining in of uh, efforts to rein in social media. It never quite works, but they're ramped up efforts. Um, there's been, it's become a more intimidating time, not just for foreign journalists, but for um, Chinese journalists. And there was just in the news, this very distressing account of the knifing of uh, Hong Kong, Hong Kong journalists. And there are other things of intimidation. And, you know, it's unclear exactly what, what went on there, but the whole overall pattern is if that one of the things that was a salutary check was an increase in a certain kind of muckraking journalism, that's now getting harder to do in China. And some of us at least really liked the idea of, in the long run, a slow trend with some backtracking towards some degree of liberalization and a little bit more of a, of a robust civil society. And the recent trends haven't been in that direction, which is really distressing. Uh, in India, I call it in India I call it post-colonial syndrome, which is in the bureaucracy. There was this act called Offic Official Secrets Act, which uh, actually um, enabled uh, government officers to uh, hide the information from public. Um, so that's that's still there in the ranks of bureaucracy because when you ask them certain things, for instance, something is already out in public, and you want to ask, say, an investigating officer, how did you find this fact? like the process, run me through it. He wouldn't because mm -hmm. it's still there in the conscious of the bureaucracy that we have to be discreet. We don't have to s talk much to the media. So that's actually proving to be a, it's, it's a really big stumbling block, um, I guess, which dates back to this act called Official S Secret Act. Anything else? Jaya? Um, well, I think, I mean, the problem now, I mean, like Jeff mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the government will la allow you to go, I mean, you know, they encourage a certain amount of um, investigation on the part of citizens as long as it doesn't implicate, you know, the, the, um, <laughs> does the leadership. And I think that's what makes it, you know, tricky for them because on the one hand, you know, when they're going after, you know, like small local officials, you know, the, the, um, the Chinese government wants to be on the side of the right and say, yes, you know, look, you know, we are, um, you know, we are nailing these corrupt officials. But, you know, there's this very, there, there's this line you can't cross. And once you get, you know, once you begin implicating those in the 
Port Bureau and the Standing Committee, you um, you know you know your um, you know your offense uh, it, you know is is too great and cannot be t- tolerated. Which is why I think you know the only rather than going after individual cases, I think um, what you know Chinese uh, a certain I mean you know, a certain number of Chinese intellectuals are trying to do is to you know to, to look for constitutionalism to look to you know to really bring about a structural change because unless you know there um, um, there uh, unless um, there is an independent judiciary unless um, you know there. Uh, there are those investigating corruption that's not, you know, part of the corrupt party, then there isn't going to be any meaningful change. It's going to end by uh, telling our panelists to keep up their, their brilliant writing and reporting from China and India. And I think I'll also say to be safe. Please join me in, in thanking the panelists for today. Thank you.